I don't normally use a podium when, when I talk, but I don't want to wander across the stage, which I also have a tendency to do. So I'm going to uh, try and stick as close as I can to this. So I'd like to start out by asking a, a pretty simple question. Who in here knows in some way, shape, or form uh, a first responder? Police officer, firefighter, military, corrections, paramedic, whatever the case may be. Okay, so a substantial number of you, that's good. The reason I ask is because what I'm gonna talk about, some of it is fairly heavy, but I feel it's important because um, those of you who put your hands up, there's about a 75% chance that what I'm gonna talk about is going on with whoever it is you know. So I'd like to start with asking you to go to the same imagination land that Adam asked you to go to, except there's cops in this one, sorry. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit of role playing with me. And I'd like you to start by picturing yourself on a country road, it's dark, it's a wet rainy night, and the only illumination is a few scattered headlights from cars that have been involved in a collision and a strobing red, blue, red, blue light from a single police car. And as you climb out of that car in the boots of that cop, your attention's drawn to a battered minivan at the side of the road. And you know that's where your attention has to lie. So you run over to that van and you run through broken glass and over plastic and you slip and slide in the fluids that the two vehicles spilled when they crashed. And as you get closer to the vehicle, you see a hand lying out the passenger sliding door. And your heart falls in your stomach, but you fight through it because you're a cop and your job is to help people, to protect life, to preserve life. So you just swallow the fear down and you get into the van. And it's dark in there, it's dark like a cave. And the, the blue-red strobing is even more pronounced and really it's the only light you've got. And as your eyes adjust, you are able to notice a single guy, looks to be about your age, lying on the floor. Wearing a nice suit, shirt, tie, well put together, but the suit is soaked with blood. Blood that's actually jetting from a wound in his neck and it's jetting so hard that it's hitting the roof of the van and splashing back down on you. So you clamp your hand on that wound even though you know your logical, rational mind knows that this guy's gonna die. He's lost too much blood, been too battered in the injury, but again, you're a cop, you don't like to let things go. Your job is to try and save this guy's life. So you move yourself around and you get your arm around his neck so you can put even more pressure on the wound. And when you're about this far from this person, you realize that you know them. Not only do you know them, you know them well, and you've been friends since high school. You just didn't recognize them because they were covered in blood and mud and debris from the vehicle and broken glass. And as your brain is coping with this, about 30 seconds later, your friend gives sort of one last shuddering breath, kind of like a sigh of resignation, and his eyes go white and he dies in your arms. Okay, so now come on back. So I'd like you to think about how would you cope with this? Because I'll tell you how I coped with it when that happened to me 12 years ago. It was actually almost 12 years ago to the day of today. First reaction was to ignore it. Didn't happen, I don't wanna talk about it, I don't wanna think about it. The nightmares are normal, the flashbacks are normal, and if I wanna be a cop, I only had about five years on the road at the time, if I wanna be a cop and a leader, I was gonna to have to, as a crusty old miserable, miserable man <laughs> said to me that night at the scene, kid, you better learn that life sucks and you better toughen the F up. So that was my debriefing. Outstanding, eh? The long-term effects, over the next seven years, I ignored pretty much everything that my body and brain was telling me was wrong. And I slipped into a very long downward spiral of isolating myself from my family and using alcohol as a crutch and burying myself in work because it was easier and ultimately having suicidal thoughts and completely isolating myself from my family. Basically, I became a recluse out in my man cave in the garage. The thing is, even the longest downward spiral has to have an end. And my end came on a cold January night in 2012 in Barrie, when my wife, Kathy, who was sitting in the crowd and has heard this story many times, and if I let her tell her side of the story, it would be vastly different, let me tell you. <laughs> we were having a very serious discussion, probably the most serious discussion in our marriage, about where were things going for us as a family. 
And that was it. That was my dam breaking. That was my crash. And I burst into tears. Tear no, tears isn't accurate. It was weeping for probably an hour. And when I was done, I felt like a dish rag that somebody had worn out or wrung out and just tossed. And it was the first time, seven years, that I said, something's wrong. I need help. I shouldn't feel this way. So within two days, I was sitting in front of a psychologist who took about five minutes to go, oh yeah, you're a, you're a train wreck. You have post yeah, both. That was, I won't say what her exact words were because she was a military psychologist and she was very blunt, but that's basically what she said is you're a train wreck. And uh, the question is now, what are you going to do? Are you going to fight to get back to the person that you were? And I said, yes, I was. And I fought and now I'm here. Now some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute. You guys go to police college, you guys go to fire college, you get trained, uh, uh, basic training as a, as a soldier. Don't they teach you guys to deal with that? You know what you signed up for. You knew death and chaos was part of the job of a cop. Why didn't you just deal with it and go on? Well, the thing is, it's easy to say that, suck it up, but it's not so easy to put into practice. There's no training, there's no learning module anywhere that can prepare you for how you're going to deal with trauma when it happens to you. Trauma is really very subjective. It uh, has lots of factors. Your age, your experience, your gender, your life history, your career, even your physical and psychological fitness, even your mood on a certain day. Something that really impacts you hard one day might hit you to a greater or lesser extent a day later because some little factor is different. Uh, and it might not hit some people at all. Resiliency is very subjective as well. Some people are more subjective than others. And uh, in fact, it's generally uh, considered that first responders and military personnel are more resilient than most members of society because they're exposed to these things over and over on a daily basis. Now, I often get asked when I do speaking, well, wait a minute, you guys go through screening, you go through psychological testing, why isn't that caught? Well, you can't catch a propensity for PTSD because you can't catch it any more than you could catch the likelihood of breaking your wrist or spraining your ankle or throwing your back out fighting with somebody. It's not a set of emotions. It's not a feeling you can chart or predict. PTSD is an actual physical biochemical reaction in your brain that changes your brain chemistry. And the more people understand that, the better. It's not a sign of weakness, it's not a I can't deal with it, it's not a suck it up. It's an actual illness, an actual psychological condition. That can be debilitating if it's not caught properly in time. Now the nice thing is that the signs and symptoms of PTSD are recognizable. But still everybody has a breaking point. And if you don't recognize those signs and those symptoms when your body and your brain are sending them to you, that's the problem. That's when you get things like heart attack or stroke or your brain explodes like something from a David Cronenberg movie. If you don't acknowledge it, that's when the trouble begins. And that has been the problem for far too long in the public safety world in Canada. Now, there is a really good aspect, though, to all this. And that is the fact that Awareness is growing. 15 years ago, someone like me or someone like a military officer or whatever would not stand in front of a group of people and talk about this. You just didn't. It was hidden. It was something you kept in-house. You didn't talk about it. The recognition of the signs and symptoms is growing. Awareness of how widespread it is is growing. And that's awesome. I'm all for awareness. The problem is, like a lot of social issues, it becomes a very easy hook for the media. So if there's a story where they can work in PTSD, they'll do it. And the reason for that is because sometimes these things that happen, these suicide by cop, or somebody who shoots up a building, or guns down five cops in an in a, uh, ambush-style attack for a social justice um, reason, we just can't fathom that. And you want to try and put a label on it, and PTSD is a convenient label. The problem is, people with PTSD aren't crazy, they aren't violent, and putting a label on every veteran because there's one or two who go off the deep end, 
isn't fair. It's not right, and it's disrespectful to the people who have served not only our country, but in militaries across the world. What usually doesn't get discussed is the fact that when there's these violent incidents, the people who are carrying them out have another co uh, concurrent condition going on. There is either a bipolar aspect or schizophrenia, or they're on a drug and alcohol bender, or they have an actual traumatic brain injury, which is an actual physical injury to the brain, and that is affecting their behavior. And when you mix that with the emotional impact of PTSD, that's the cocktail that's leading to these issues. Somebody with a straight, regular uh, assessment of PTSD is no more violent, is no more aggressive than the regular average person you would grab on the street. So you can see right there, when other factors like alcohol and drug misuse, other psychiatric disorders or age are considered, the association between PTSD and violence is decreased. Okay. So a couple of times I've mentioned suicide. And unfortunately, you can't discuss trauma in North America in the first responder role without discussing suicide. I wouldn't say it's at epidemic levels, but it's certainly way higher than it should be. Is anybody familiar with the 22 push-up challenge? Did anybody actually do it? Oh, you're, you're a rock star. I got to day 18 and I said to hell with it, I'm done. <laughs> what, it, what it is, if you're not familiar with it, this is a phenomenon that kind of swept across Facebook and Twitter over the summer and, and early fall. And the challenge was to do 22 push-ups a day for 22 days in a row to honor the 22 veterans, give or take, who, t uh, not, I'm sorry, not just veterans, military personnel, who take their lives in the US military every day. Now that number seems excessively high, but you need to remember the US military is a massive, massive organization with deployments all over the world and people who are constantly under stress, especially in active combat zones. However, we're not immune from it in Canada either. So this is the stats to date for 2016. So at this point, and this was accurate as of Monday, and I hope it hasn't changed, 52 people in the public safety world have committed suicide. Now, is that a super high number? Well, no. All things considered, not really. Not when you consider how many people fit those criteria in Canada. I think the more shocking aspect for most people is that uh, this is seen as a weakness, and people are surprised because they figure people in uniform have seen it all, have done it all, are level-headed, are psychologically fit to serve, and they can't figure out why they would take this ultimate step. Well, I'm not gonna debate the ethics of suicide. That is an intensely personal held opinion based on your faith and your religion and your own morals and ethics. What I will put forth is um, a theory that when someone in uniform kills themselves related to their job, it's because they saw something so profoundly impacting that marked them so deeply that they have no alternative except for ending the pain and the visions and the things they see when they close their eyes every night by taking their own life. And having been there, I can understand that. Having been that low once or twice, I can see how that would happen. And then that brings us full circle to the question I asked. Well, you know what you were signing up for. Come on, that's bull. No one signs up for suicide. Nobody signs up to see something that makes you want to put your gun to your head. We signed up to serve, to protect, to take care of society. The fact that this is happening simply means somewhere there's a breakdown in the system. Now, the really nice thing is that stuff like this is reducing the stigma. Like I said, 20 years ago, you would never find this. You never find somebody willing to break the blue code and talk about it. The fact that I can stand here in front of a group full of people and talk about these very intimate details of something that happened to me is amazing. And that's the kind of thing that will break the stigma. And when the stigma goes away, the shame and the fear associated to admitting that you have a psychological injury, that'll go away as well. When the fear is reduced, the fear, or sorry, when the stigma is reduced, the fear of seeking help is reduced. And that's what we need. Because it might only be 52, but in my mind, damn it, 52 is still too many. Okay, so that was all pretty heavy. 
right? So I'm gonna bring things back up a little bit. So there is a really, really cool concept that's gaining momentum in the, in the mental health world, the, the trauma world, and it's called post-traumatic growth. And I use that as an analogy for it. The theory of post-traumatic growth is that if you come through trauma with your support, with your treatment, with whatever therapy you go through, you actually come out of it a better, stronger person. Better parent, more patient parent. I know definitely I was a more patient parent because I was not the most patient guy when I was in the depths of my PTSD. Um, better spouse, more compassionate, more empathetic first responder. Whatever your own personal hell is that you came through, you came out of it and you're a stronger person for it. Now, not only is this a great thing for people actually dealing with trauma to hook onto, it's a great thing for people who support them to hook onto. Because being somebody who supports somebody with PTSD, especially a stubborn cop or a stubborn firefighter or paramedic or whatever, is not very easy. So the people who live with people with trauma and support them and take care of them and alternately love or hate them depending on the day, that's something for them to hook on to. The fact that, yeah, this was a horrible time. The last however many years was awful. But the thought that you're gonna get your person in uniform back, a better, stronger version of themselves, that's awesome. That's something to really hold on to. And I have to believe in that because, quite frankly, I lived it. By all, by all accounts, I should be single and jobless and homeless living somewhere on the streets of Barrie or moving from town to town across northern Ontario. And if my wife and my family were different people, well, that's exactly what would have happened. But uh, it didn't happen. And I said, I'm here. Like I said, I'm here telling a room full of not complete strangers, but strangers, very intimate details of my life. And I'm okay with that because it gets the word out. Out in that hallway, I have a stack of books with my name on it, which is something I never, ever thought I would have. And in that book, I go in even more detail about how low I sunk before I finally asked for help. And I'm okay with that, too. I have a wife who took what she went through and took the pain and the suffering and all the hell that I put her through and used it to change careers from teaching to counseling other families and spouses of first responders so that other families don't have to go through where we were five or six years ago. I mean, basically, I was given a second chance. And you don't get many second chances in life. And squandering it would be a complete and utter waste. So I've chosen not to squander it. And I mean, I'm not alone in that by any means. Um, if you look around, you can find lots of stories of redemption. The problem is the media and culture likes to tell you that PTSD or other operational stress injuries are a life sentence. Well, they're not. It's not a life sentence. It doesn't have to mean the end of your career, the end of your marriage, the end of your status as a parent, or the end of your life. If you let it happen, then it will be. If you choose to fight like I did, and I am considered, I am consider myself one of the lucky ones, then yeah, that's, it, it's not a life sentence, folks. And I, I put this up because I'm not sure if anybody is involved in the, uh, anybody who is a first responder in military, this is called a challenge coin. So a challenge coin is something that you carry to represent a significant accomplishment or you were on a specialized unit or you made it through a particularly difficult combat mission, whatever the case may be. I carry mine as a reminder because it says two things. On one side it says you're not alone and on the other side it says PTSD is an honorable injury. Now, since I came out of the closet, so to speak, about my PTSD, I've had first responders from all over the place email me and ask me, you know, what did you do and how do I start and where do I go? And what I tell them right off the bat is two things. A, it's okay not to be okay. B, you're not alone. Hearing that you're not alone, hearing that somebody gets where your head's at and understands what you're going through is incredibly rewarding and incredibly comforting. But sometimes I need to remind myself of that. So that's why I carry this coin. Lots of people do across Canada. We carry it because then even on our lowest day, we remember that there's people out there who get it. There's people out there who appreciate and respect first responders. And we carry it to remember that the invisible wounds you have from PTSD are not as something to be ashamed of, something to be honored for and by. And that we do have backup out there who's looking out for us. So having said that, 
I'd like to thank you for being my backup today. Enjoy the rest of your day.